If you're looking to upgrade your existing bridge network to Google Wi-Fi, then watch this video. Hi, GaryCruz.com here. If you're new to my channel, I cover everyday gadgets and technology. Today, I'll be covering my process of upgrading from the Airport Extreme to Google Wi-Fi Mesh. While I was considering upgrading my access points, Xfinity Gig became available in my network and I decided to upgrade to that as well. I ran into a couple of hiccups that I'll cover later. First, I'll share a little bit of my home networking background. I've gone through a few changes with my home network throughout the years. First, having one Airport Extreme, to then trying out Ethernet over power, and ultimately, I hired some folks to run Cat 6A cables from my office upstairs to two other areas within the house where the Airport Extremes were connected to. Why did I decide to go with Cat 6A? Because I was planning to upgrade to 10 gig E. In fact, I already purchased two 10 gig E switches and will be upgrading soon after I publish this video. So be sure to subscribe and hit the notification button so you can keep up to date with that. For full disclosure, I purchased all this gear with my own money and these opinions are my own. First, let's go over why I'm replacing my two Airport Extremes. Although Apple no longer supports them, that wasn't a big deal for me since I never had to contact Apple through the many years I've owned these. I bought these 6th generation Extremes when it was released on June 10, 2013. The biggest problem I had is that whenever the internet was slow, I knew that the first thing I had to do was restart the Wi-Fi on the device I was having issues with. Let's say with my MacBook, I went from the family room and went to the master bedroom, the connection would stall. That is what the network admins call sticky clients. If you want a detailed explanation, I put a link in the description. I set up the airports as a roaming network with an Asus router in the office and the airports acting as a wireless bridge in the other areas of the house all sharing the same SSID. The problem is that whatever the laptop first connected to, it will stick to that access point even though there is a closer one with a stronger signal. Most enterprise access points take care of this. The third issue is that there's no way to create a true mesh with the ASUS and airport extremes. I have one camera and a ring doorbell on the first floor that has trouble connecting to the second floor Airport Extreme. With the new setup, I went with the Google Wi-Fi 4-pack from Costco. The main downside is that instead of having three additional switched Ethernet ports, there's only one. Therefore, I had to buy some inexpensive Netgear 5-port switches. Since I was reworking my home network, I also decided to upgrade to gig speed Ethernet from Xfinity. I had the old Motorola Surfboard SB6141. Sometimes it might be a better deal to buy a modem if you can find a good deal. I have a link to the new Motorola Doxis 3.1 modem in the description below. Keep a note that even with Google Wi-Fi, you'll need to connect to a modem. The modem is what provides the internet. Google Wi-Fi will provide the coverage and routing of the additional devices to your home. Here's the Motorola MB8600 I received from Amazon. It's backwards compatible with Doxis 3.0 if you haven't upgraded yet. Under the yellow sticker are additional Ethernet ports. This cable modem has four Gig E LAN ports with support for bonding, two ports, and hardware to support bonding all four ports. Your top actual speed is about one gigabit per second without bonding, about two gigabits per second with two ports bonded, and about 3.8 gigabits per second with four ports bonded. You'll need a managed switch that supports lag. The coax is where you plug in the cable from Xfinity, and it's nice that it also includes a power button. What's nice is that it's fanless. The right and left and top side of the MB8600 are generously covered by lots of cutouts to ensure a proper airflow. This is an important step to keep the device cool, thus ensuring its longevity. And through the lateral vent holes, you can actually see the internal circuits. On the front, LED indicators have the power indicator. For the downstream, you want it to be a solid blue to show that it has bonded with two or more channels. The upstream should also be blue for the same reason. Online should be blue for DOCSIS 3.1 or green for DOCSIS 3.0. And then the LAN will be blinking for data and blue for bonded link ports. When I first plugged it in, it didn't work right away. 
It should have taken me to the activation website. If the activation page does not appear automatically, please go to xfinity.com slash internet setup. Comcast will need to know the account number of your cable service and the phone number associated with your account for activation. This can be found on your Comcast monthly bill statement. I eventually called support and gave them the modem details like the modem manufacturer, model number, serial number, and MAC address. If you go to 198.168.100.1 in your browser, it will take you to the cable modem setup page. The default username is admin. The default password is Motorola. My initial speed tests were disappointing. I was getting 196.12 megabits per second with an upload of 34.19, which was faster than the 10 megabits I was getting before for the upload. I then reached out to customer support and they said that they'll send some new provisioning signals. After some back and forth, the issue was with the billing system. It wasn't synced with their other systems. Once that was resolved, I got the speed I was looking for. Just keep in mind that these have to be wired tests. I already detached two of the Apple Extreme access points that were set up in bridge mode. They were connected to an Asus router. I really liked how it had three LAN ports built in and a USB port that I used to connect to a printer or external hard drive. Since the Google Wi-Fi only has two ports, I'll connect one of the ports to a Netgear GS305 switch. This will give me two additional ports compared to the three that Apple provided in my old setup. When opening the 4-pack, you'll find a Google Wi-Fi 3-pack and one additional Google Wi-Fi point. In case you're wondering, they're all the same, meaning that there isn't one that is designated as a router and the others as access points. We live in a 3-story, 1,800-square-foot townhome with the modem on the third floor. This will effectively provide coverage for the whole house. Ideally, I would want to have a full Ubiquiti network set up, but in the meantime, I decided on this to replace my frustrations with the ASUS slash router setup until Wi-Fi 6 becomes a standard in late 2019 or early 2020. When comparing to Google to the Apple, the footprint is very close. The biggest difference is in the height. Each Wi-Fi point comes with a power cable to USB-C. The three pack includes one ethernet cable. Here's a comparison to the Google Wi-Fi next to the Apple Airport Extreme. One of my airports also had a hard drive for Time Machine, but I'll be using my NAS for that moving forward. One port is for the WAN and the other is for the LAN that I'll connect to switch to. The contents of the additional Google Wi-Fi is similar, but it also includes its own ethernet cable. Finally, here's everything unboxed. This is what I'll be connecting throughout my home. On the second floor family room closet, I have a Synology DS Play that acts as a backup for the NAS upstairs, a Mac Mini as a Plex server, and a TiVo, which will all be connected to the five port switch. Just outside the closet is a Wink2 hub for our home automation, which is connected via ethernet back into the closet. Installing the modem. I found a place in the closet upstairs to mount the modem. I left enough space on each side for ventilation. Next, it's time to replace the router. The cable modem connection is in black. Red is going to the switch. This one's going to the laser printer. This one going to the PC. The last one is going to the phone. The USB is for the Epson inkjet printer that didn't have its own networking. On the switch. One is going to the second floor closet. This one goes to the living room. And now I'll just plug in the connections I removed from the router. All my networking gear is connected to a UPS, which helps keep the network up for an hour after the power goes out. See the description for details. Installing Google Wi-Fi. Now I'll connect the first Google Wi-Fi to the cable modem into the WAN port. Then I'll connect the switch to the LAN port. Once you have downloaded the Google Wi-Fi app, follow the directions to scan the QR code. The app will automatically find your Wi-Fi point. 
When prompted, point your phone camera to the QRE code on the base of your Wi-Fi point. This will automatically connect your phone to your Google Wi-Fi point. Then select a location of the Google Wi-Fi point so that it'll help you identify it later. When done, click Next. When asked, create a name for your Wi-Fi network. I chose the same name and password as before, so all my previous devices will connect to it automatically. You can then connect to the network you just created. Then go and select that you have three more to set up. Setting up additional Wi-Fi points. Additional Wi-Fi points work best when they're no more than two rooms away. Also try putting them in an open space. Although this one is initially in the closet, I moved it to where the Wink2 hub was on the mantle of the fireplace. Just follow the similar instructions of scanning the QR code as before and repeat this process with the other Wi-Fi points. After your Wi-Fi points are set up, the app will download and install the Google Wi-Fi software, which will include the latest features and security measures. This could take up to 10 minutes. Your Wi-Fi points will then restart and your Wi-Fi network will be down until the Wi-Fi points fully turn on when the light is a solid teal. Then you're done. Take some time to review the release notes. The app will show you an overview of your network. I then ran all the tests. And what's nice is that it will review the network connection via the Wi-Fi point that is wired since it would be your true bandwidth of the network. Wireless speeds will always be slower. Speed tests. I wanted to see if there was a difference between the full mesh network and having the access points hardwired via Ethernet, also known as a wired backhaul. Every secondary Wi-Fi point, if you plugged into the Ethernet, will first try to find a path back to the primary point. If it can, then it chooses Ethernet for backhaul. If it can't, it'll choose wireless for backhaul to the other mesh points it can detect and talk to wirelessly. If a secondary point is using a wireless backhaul, then it becomes a bridge and the two Ethernet ports can then be used for wired devices to connect locally. For the mesh tests, I disconnected the family room and living room access points from the wired ethernet and ran some tests. As you can see in this graph, the mesh download speeds were more than half the speed of the backhauled connection. In other words, if you upgraded to gig speeds and only used wireless, then you aren't using the full potential of your bandwidth. Fortunately, I get the full speed on my Mac and PC upstairs because they're wired directly to the ethernet switch. I really like how easy it was to set up. The true mesh network extended my network to the garage to provide better coverage for the cameras on the first floor. One SSID is much nicer and easier to administer. I no longer have to reset networks when moving between rooms. The nice clean design matches our interior decor. For the cons, I now have to use VPN on devices separately versus setting them up on the router. With only two ethernet ports, I had to buy switches to extend the Ethernet to other devices. And without a USB port, I can't create a simple network storage. However, I upgraded my NAS to take care of that. In summary, I'm very happy that I upgraded my network and I think it's been the easiest setup I've ever seen. I've been using this for six months with no issues to note. If you like the control and flexibility of firmware hacked ASUS router, you may want to stick to that. But with the extended coverage of a true mesh network, with consistent network speed and coverage on all three floors of our townhome makes this perfect for us, especially at this price point from Costco. My next project is to tackle the backup speeds between my two Synology NAS devices. I purchased QNAP NAS devices with built-in 10 gigabit networking, which will require me to upgrade the switches and transfer my data from Synology. Please stay tuned by hitting that subscribe button and the notification button. Thanks for watching.